So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming today to this event um, between Cochrane and um, Campbell. I will make some brief introductory remarks about the use of evidence and the importance of evidence. Um, evidence is, of course, important because there are many pressing social and economic problems, both the old problems of persistent poverty, of malnutrition, of women's impression, and so on, but also new emerging problems like farmer suicide, child trafficking, um, substance abuse, that are emerging as, as important issues in India. And the fact is that there is evidence available on how to tackle these problems and improve the lives of the poor and disadvantaged. But that evidence is not being used. That evidence is not being used in India, it's not being used around the world. This is ironic because actually the last 30 years have seen an evidence revolution. And there's been three waves of this evidence revolution I will speak about briefly now, but it's very much an unfinished revolution. And in many parts of India, down in the states and districts, it's an evidence revolution that's yet to begin. So let's just talk briefly about these three waves of the evidence revolution. This evidence revolution began back in the 1980s, particularly the 1990s, with what was called new public management. New public management particularly took root in the Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglophone countries, in the UK and earlier on in the US and New Zealand and Australia and so on. And one key focus of new public management was a focus on outcomes, on measures of things that make a difference to people's lives. And for those, those of us old enough to remember, this really was a change. Because back in the 70s and 80s, we used to measure perform program performance just by the amount of money that had been spent. Okay, we spent all the budget, therefore we've been successful. That was no way to measure performance. And one of the main contributions of new public management was this focus on outcomes, saying, well, how, how many children have we reached with this program, this, this supplementary feeding program, and, um, and so on. How many farmers have been trained, and so on. The problem with new public management and this focus on outcomes was that it mistook measuring outcomes to measuring what contributed to the achievement of those outcomes. So it's very good to use indicators to measure what you've spent, what you've achieved in terms of outputs, number of people reached given that cost and so on. If you've achieved your, re your target for reaching people, children receiving supplementary feeding and so on. But it would be a mistake to attribute changes in child malnutrition to those government programs, to those NGO programs who are trying to tackle child malnutrition. Many things affect outcomes, and so you cannot simply track outcomes to see what's contributed to those changes. So in governments that are set in place outcome monitoring systems, like the US and the UK, um, India set up an uh, um, outcome monitoring system rather late in the day, but it did establish one over the last few years across all ministries, but it was closed down un under the current government, so there isn't currently one. But in the government countries where they had these systems, they realised, after a point in time, they could not tell them why these outcomes are being achieved. The simple factual observation of what outcomes are being achieved is not the same as a counterfactual analysis of what caused those changes in outcomes. So in the early 2000s, the General Accounting Office in the US, which oversaw the results reporting of different government departments, wrote to them saying, we do not accept that monitoring outcomes is a valid measure of your impact. Simply measuring outcomes, how they change over time, does not measure agency impact and should not be taken to do so. So what do we do? How do we measure agency impact? There we came to the second wave of the evidence revolution, using valid counterfactuals in, uh, in social programs. They've been used to growing effect, particularly in, in the health field, particularly in medical trials, but are supplying the same principles of randomized controlled trials, other non-experimental designs, to measure the impact of social programs. This is the second wave of the evidence revolution. It's been very important, and you see across all countries, a growing number of randomized controlled trials across all sectors, but for a variety of reasons, and in the US in particular, you saw growth of what were called evidence-based programs, and a program be proven to work in a particular context and be called an evidence-based program and be promoted for adoption elsewhere. But that's wrong. 
You can't stop there at that second wave of the evidence revolution. Because what works in one context, what works for one population, may not work elsewhere. You can't say, it worked in Chicago, let's do it in Chennai. You have to say, oh, well, something worked in Chicago, maybe we should try it and test it in Chennai. Evidence-based policy is not a blueprint approach. It doesn't say it worked somewhere else, let's do it here. It worked somewhere else, let's try it here. But the key thing about one of the failings of the second wave of the evidence revolution, one of the shortcomings, is we should not be basing policy on a single study from elsewhere. We should base our policy and practice on the global evidence base. As there's a growing amount of evidence coming from randomized control trials, and other studies across the world, of what works and what doesn't, we should combine all of that knowledge, building accumulating bodies of knowledge, into systematic reviews. And systematic reviews are the third wave of the, co of the evidence revolution. Cochrane has been pushing this agenda now for over 25 years in the health field, well, because 25 years in the health field. Um, Campbell has been doing so but with much success to date in, in other sectors. But where we've seen the growth of evidence-based medicine, where we've seen WHO requiring guidelines to be based on systematic reviews, this is showing the, the way in which the third wave of the evidence revolution should play out. In some countries, they've institutionalized use evidence from systematic reviews. So you have the What Works Clearinghouse in the US promoting use of review evidence. You have the What Works Center in the UK. And you have in Nordic countries, um, government departments, government research departments set up to produce reviews that have been demanded by different um, government departments. So what you what you don't see that in many other countries. You don't see that in many developing countries. You don't see in many developing countries commissioning reviews to inform policy and practice. You see some of it here in India. ICMR, for example, commissioning reviews. But it's the exception, not the norm. And you barely see it, if at all, outside of the health sector. You don't see in social welfare, in social work, in education, in um, criminal policy, in policing policy, you don't see government departments commissioning or even using existing reviews from existing global evidence database. Now some people say, oh but you can't use global evidence, this is injury, injury is different, and actually injury is very varied. But the fact is, the global evidence is what we have. Um, if you speak to someone who says, oh injury is different to Bangladesh, you can't look at global evidence, but you speak to someone at, down at state level, they'll say, oh, AP is different to Tamil Nadu. You can't look at Tamil Nadu and learn something for AP. You go to AP, they'll say, oh, but now Gondra is a different district to other districts. Go to a district, they'll say, oh, but this village is different to that village. Go to the village, they'll say, but this house is different to that house. How far will you take this? Do you want a different intervention for every single household? Of course, there are transferable lessons that we can learn from our experience elsewhere. Take farmer suicides. There's a systematic review of suicide interventions. None of those studies come from India. So are we going to say, let's just ignore what's been learned from elsewhere about suicide prevention? Or are we going to say, let's at least look at what's been tried elsewhere to tackle suicide and try and learn from that? Maybe these programs are not applicable in India. Fair enough. But remember, evidence-based policy is not a, not a blueprint approach. You see what's worked elsewhere, and then try and adapt it and see if it will work here. But the key thing that we've learned in this 30 years of the evidence revolution is that most things don't work. It's what I call the 80% rule. We look in the private sector, in nearly every country in the world, 80% of all new businesses fail in the first five to 10 years. Private companies have been at the forefront of the evidence revolution. Companies like Microsoft and Google do thousands of randomized control trials. If you live in a developed country, you're exposed to a dozen randomized control trials a day without knowing it. Every time you go into a supermarket, open direct mailing, you're being exposed to a randomized control trial. This is what the private sector does. And what they found is that 80 to 90% of the things they do to improve company performance do not work. What about the public sector? Do we really think that public sector programs are any better? Of course they're not but they don't have the same bottom line that companies have. But doing rigorous impact evaluations about public programs is that bottom line. And when we've done those studies, we've found they don't work. The Institute of Education Sciences in the US found that 80%, or actually, no, sorry, 90% of 90 programs they evaluated didn't work. The US government evaluated 11 programs with budgets of over $1 billion each. 10 of them didn't work. Department of Labor evaluated a range of labor programs to get employment re-entry. 75% of them didn't work. 80% of things don't work. 
most of the things we're doing, most of the things that come injury supporting, most of the things NGOs are doing to empower women, to stop uh, child trafficking, to um, stop pharmaceuticals, don't work, but we don't know it because they're not being tested. The evidence revolution is not unfinished. It's only unfinished, it's, it's passing us by. So this is the key thing. So what we're going to hear today are examples where evidence has been used to inform policy. But we're also going to be examples where evidence not have been used to inform policy. And our job, certainly our job at Campbell's, the international agency, is not to tell policymakers what to do, not to tell practitioners not what to do, not to say, this is the policy, you should do this. Our job is to make evidence available, available to be considered by policymakers and practitioners, by decision makers, and to decide what to do with that evidence. Our job is to help interpret and use that evidence as policymakers see fit in their, uh, in their context, given the constraints they face. And this event, hopefully, is a contribution and a platform to advocacy, not for particular programs, but for advocacy for the use of evidence coming from high-quality systematic reviews of the sort produced by Campbell and Cochrane. Thank you.